Welcome everyone to our fall book party. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this event is, is designed to celebrate the achievements of our faculty and students, our colleagues, our collaborators, um, and it's my in incredible honor to welcome you today. I'd like to, to, to give a, particular in a particularly important welcome to our retired Emeriti faculty who are joining us. It's so good to see everybody back here on campus. Welcome, welcome. brings back so many great memories. Um, it's wonderful. And I also like to sh uh, send a shout out to our first year graduate students who are now in the audience. Who are now, this is their first book party and who are now trying to be part of our community. Uh, welcome to you all as well. Uh, we also have colleagues, old and new, Dr. Noriko Manabe has joined us. She's recently hired in Ooh. Jacob School of Music. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Um, Today is a particularly important book party. I was looking at our list of, of books that we're going to celebrate, uh, and I was kind of overcome with this theme of collaboration. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to kind of highlight very briefly, is uh, you'll notice that our, our colleagues are collaborators. You'll notice that the research that we're celebrating today is all fruits of various forms of collaboration, sometimes disciplinary, sometimes generational. And you'll notice that several of our faculty are publishing with their students and former students. Uh, we have collaborations across a lot of different lines. Um, and to me, that, that signals a strength of what we're doing in the sense that uh, there are a lot of people out there who kind of get what we're doing, and they want to be part of it. And it comes out in things like this. I'll point out that performing environmentalism was the brainchild of one of John McDowell's tedious faculty retreats. <laughs> uh, in fact, we might say this is the highlight of the 16 faculty retreats I've ever been to. <laughs> idea of thinking about areas of influence, areas of collaboration within our faculty. We came up with three little study groups. One of those study groups was on environmentalism, and over time, it ended up in this incredibly interesting and provocative volume, which brought together faculty in folklore and ethnomusicology, as well as contributors, both within the alumni of, of those two institutions. It, to me, that's kind of what collaborations, uh, the best ones, end up in. And so, John, thank you for that, you know. I'll notice that Soli's edited volume is, is co-edited with one of our alumni, um, Mincy Martinez, and, and, and if you look through that work, you find names of all part of our community. The chapter is written by folks who you already know them when you, when you crack open the book. These kinds of collaborations, I think, are, are really quite important. Um, and, and it's also interesting that we notice we have two co-authored books that we're talking about today, and, and to me, this signals also for points, new points of collaboration in writing, and new collaborations and publications, maybe displacing authorial authority of that, maybe rethinking positionality and how we look and how we write and how we represent, maybe pointing to new ways in which we do our great work. Um, to me, that's all exciting stuff. Uh, that's really where I find such interest in the work we're going to celebrate today. What we'll do is we'll have a kind of a toast to uh, celebration for each of these books presented by a colleague and faculty member and then after we're done we'll hopefully all matriculate back over to the department where our wonderful staff has has prepared for us uh, a great spread of probably cube uh, shaped food and drinks no cubes uh, this time no cubes no cubes this time okay uh, perhaps gelatinous food and drinks i don't know but it will not be cube based which is good uh, with that being said, I'll invite our first presenter, uh, I believe Diane, I think you're first up, who will be presenting Barbara Hiller's edited volume, Charms, Charmers, and Charming in Ireland. Thank you. Roughly 30 years ago, in Newfoundland, my friend Pius Power introduced me to his father, Pius Power Sr. Mr. Power was widely known as a formidable performer, a man who had as people say all the stories. During the time I spent with him, among other things, Mr. Power told me that he believed in blood stopping because he had seen it numerous times, but that he wasn't sure if he believed in men walking on the moon because he had never seen that. And indeed, when the first spacewalk was televised in 1965, 
Mr. Power's community had no televisions, or for that matter, electricity. And, he, and had he had that access, it just might be that television as an unknown genre would have seemed entirely fictional to him anyway. Mr. Power told me that when he was young, there was no hospital or doctor for miles, so they depended on blood stopping, where a person with the gift to do so would say a few words and pass their hands over the bleeding body parts, and within minutes, the bleeding would slow and then stop. Charms, Charmers, and Charming in Ireland, from the medieval to the modern, is about exactly that gifted act and powerful words in Mr. Power's story. Edited by Alana Toomey, John Carey, Kieran O'Galvin, and our own Barbara Hillers, Charms, Charmers, and Charming in Ireland is a collection of essays published in 2019 in the New Approaches to Celtic Religion and Mythology series issued by University of Wales Press. Noted by the editors to be the first collection of scholarly essays ever to have been devoted to Irish charms, the volume arose out of the 2016 conference of the ISFNR, the International Society for Folk Narrative Research, Committee on Charms, Charmers, and Charming, held at University College Cork. Fourteen papers from the conference on the theme of tradition and innovation form the basis of the collection of essays, which explores texts from the old Irish period, 650 to 900, to current practices. The first half of the volume deals largely with medieval sources, while the second half explores modern tradition, beginning with the 19th century. The roughly chronological movement through source material in the chapters fits perfectly with the matching evolution of method inspired by the growth availability of contextual material. Charms are what Jacqueline Borse calls words with power, words with which people believe themselves to be able to influence reality in a supernatural way. Magical texts, writes Borse, such as spells, charms, and incantations, form one genre among these words of power. Their verbal power includes healing, harming, and protection. And the genre also can take the form of or meld at times with prayer. Found as single lines, poems, prayers, or narrative, the charms are tenacious in trans transition, sorry, transmission. The extraordinary age of the materials discussed in this volume, John Kerry argues, is due to their power. When words are thought to be imbued with power, he writes, there is a natural motivation for seeking to preserve them in order to preserve the marvelous capabilities that they confer. Alana Toomey, for example, explores 900 years of one charm, the Capua Christi charm, one text of which will provide an example here of the genre. Focused on healing eyes, vision, or headache, the charm reads, the head of Christ, the eyes of Isaiah, the bridge of the nose of Noah, the lips and tongue of Solomon, the neck of Timothy, the mind of Benjamin, the chest of Paul, the joint of John, the faith of Abraham. Holy, holy, holy to the end. In some versions, the charm comes with instructions. From 1395, the instructions that follow demonstrate the interconnectedness of word and act, as well as the complexity of the tradition. Quote, this is sung every day about your head against headache. After singing, if you spit twice your palm, and you put it around your two temples and on the back of your head, and you sing the Patre Nostra, the Lord's Prayer, three times there, uh, and you put a cross of the saliva on the top of your head, and then you make the sign five times on the head." End quote. Later papers include information on charms in use, largely from manuscript sources. Nicholas Wolfe includes the following narrative from the 1860 Gaelic manuscript of change from charm dealer, Dan she Daniel Sheehan. Mr. Sheehan had applied this charm a few days ago under the following circumstances. An old woman named Mrs. Kiley came into the house of his son, William Sheehan, of Kerrigal, and seeing there a fine boy about three years of age, she explained several times what a fine boy and praised him in other words without saying God bless him. Three or four hours after she left the house, the boy changed color 
black in the face, emotionless. Mr. Dan Sheehan, his grandfather, was sent for. He repeated the charm, and in about two hours, the boy began to recover. He repeated the charm, fasting, on the two following mornings. But the boy was quite well in six hours. The way the charms point to wider belief dynamics is intriguing. The Sheehan narrative highlights the way the charms reveal things we know about belief. The feared consequences of envy, from, for example, in Mr. Sheehan's story, and seen as a motif found in belief traditions around the world. In the discussion of blood stopping, the analogy of blood stopping to Christ's still religious waters finds wider distribution and points to the significance of biblical symbolism and healing. Taboos concerning revealing sources or words or payment for healing also come through in the charms or their narratives. Barbara's caper comes in the middle of the book, a gateway to the second section on modern charms. She explores the corpus of 500 seven collected examples of nine charms, all collected from oral sources in the first half of the 20th century by the Irish Folklore Commission. Barbara demonstrates the problems and benefits of typological approaches to charms, that is, by the charm itself, and functional approaches by use of her treatment category, noting that the field is best served by combining both approaches. While her paper is framed as an exploration of archival it illustrates the use of charms in exploring linguistic and geographic information on borrowing and transmission, culture contact, continuity, and variation and change. The paper demonstrates beautifully the greatest strength of the book, which is to be found throughout in the way the charms can be used as a body of evidence to explore and illuminate the larger workings of oral tradition and transmission. Throughout the volume, the age, massive scope, and comprehensiveness of the collection, combined with the strength of scholarship and diversity of foci and methodology, highlight how folklore moves, what its evidential material is, and how it can be used, and how belief and worldview work. This is true throughout, even in the nuanced small observations. For example, the Cat Food Christ charm offers earlier, offered earlier begins with, you'll remember, the head of Christ, the eyes of Isaiah. Jimmy notes the curious spelling for Isaiah, not typically used in Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, is likely a phonetic spelling pointing to the oral transmission of the charm in a period of transitional literacy. In other words, spelling points to cultural movement and conflict. Seeing the themes and patterns side by side, even in the most fragmented of materials, being um, brings the genre alive. The use of analogy, comparison and transmission, maps and mobility, thoughts about speech and theory. These kinds of observations, along with insights into consistency and variation afforded by the massiveness of the gathered source materials, instructs the reading audience how folklore, even that which is so old that it is seemingly lacking in contextual material, can be read as evidence of cultural understanding, behavior, formativity and cultural mobility. I am reminded that as a student, I was dismissive of indexes of belief materials that lacked contextual material, like the Frank C. Brown collection, only later discovering the incredible descriptive and comparative depth of those indexes if you look beyond the surface. A genre like charms would have been likewise less interesting to me at the time due to its brevity compared to the fuller, more narrative, or more action-oriented belief genres. Charms, Charmers, and Charming in Ireland powerfully <coughs> demonstrates exactly why both biases were mistaken, showing the kind of sleuthing we can use to make the most of the breadth and depth of source material available to us. It is a charming collection, <laughs> and I highly recommend it. <laughs> 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 and with the rebuttal, Barbara, we'll have a rebuttal. <laughs> Diane's review. <laughs> no, in fact, Barbara is our next presenter, and she'll be honoring uh, the truth of myth. Hello. 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 <laughs> oh, well, Diane, the thing I hate about these book parties is 
is that like, we are dangerously close to Nobel Prize, <laughs> you know, presentations finely crafted. And so when Greg asked me to talk about um, his book, The Truth of Myth, I was of course moved and honored. And I said, Greg, I don't do these fancy speeches. And he said, he wrote in an email, I have it in print, all I want is some honest observations. <laughs> <laughs> so, being <laughs> Greg, I know he actually means it. Um, so, not so finely crafted, uh, but honest observations. First of all, I have to say, I miss Greg. <laughs> um, such a wise and kind colleague as you could wish for. And our Miss Man, you know, and when you got him at the right moment, that he was Miss Chip Chivas. <laughs> and those light moments um, made up for many a uh, faculty meeting. <laughs> and, um, so there was this moment when I said, how did you get into this in the first place? And yet this glint in the eye that the myth seemed deep. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg is our myth guy. And although we all have intersected with um, myth, or most of us, I'm sure, it, in some ways, and, you know, he does it full performance, full throttle. And in reviewing uh, his book, I really feel I'm gate crashing. Because I was a myth person, I always wanted to be. I'm German after all. <laughs> <laughs> um, until I was age 24, and then I stepped into the National Folk Archives in Ireland and, you know, gave over to that intoxicating brew that some of us have tasted of tales and legend and social tradition and material culture that you can find inside the archives in Ireland and outside. Um, so myth, myth went backsliding and um, I felt this as a really welcome opportunity to see what I had missed when I took that wrong turn in the road. Um, <laughs> It's no problem with this book if you are gate crashing, because it's actually uh, talking to not just experts, insiders, but actually um, anyone who really wants to find out. And it works so hard to be user friendly, and I really appreciate that. So it's a useful book. Make use of it. Make your students buy it. Buy it yourself. <laughs> Um, the authors call it an intellectual travel guide, I like that. Um, yeah, this is a useful podium where there's no things that go down there. charm and it will stay there. Um, so an intellectual travel guide to world mythology and a toolkit to understand. And they are committing themselves in print to presenting the material in a manner that is approachable, readable, and comprehensible. And they succeed in doing that. And that is all the more remarkable that they mention about, if I didn't sound wrong, about 55 learned writers about mythology, <laughs> all with very long names <laughs> and very long theories. So this is a remarkable uh, achievement. Um, so, what is it? It's, the book does not represent another theory of myth, um, but rather tries to establish a common vocabulary and that toolkit um, to understand various ways of looking at myth cross-culturally um, and comparatively. And that's sort of spelled out in chapter three, studying mythology comparatively, uh, which is particularly useful and which I'll zoom in on later. 
but um, first of all, sort of what's what's in this book? Um, it's a real service to um, anyone interested in mythology, but I think it's a real um, service to folkloristics because it firmly, you know, myth is something that everybody claims, right? And this really uh, firmly locates the study of myth within our discipline, without in the least bit being, you know, fencing it off from other disciplines and being isolationist um, on the contrary. Um, I was for eight years um, on the steering committee of a program, undergraduate program, that was entitled Folk and Myth. And um, between our group of colleagues, we, we would pass note how the pendulum seemed to swing from folk to myth and back again. Um, and I think there is a real importance of keeping myth central in any folklore department. Um, so I, this is part of missing Greg. <laughs> um, and we just um, have to find ways of addressing that and, and putting it in, in, we are already dealing with it uh, in our curriculum. We're doing our best at any rate. Um, okay, so what's in here? Um, there's four chunky chapters, um, one definitions, and I'll briefly look at that because I think it's really, really helpful. Uh, then there is a highlights in the history of mythological research. That's the 55 thinkers, writers about mythology. 55 thinkers in circa 55 pages um, from Xenophanes, from 500 BCE to Gayatri Spivak, late 20th century. So it's a roller coaster, right? <laughs> um, it's not always, sometimes it's a bit painful if a writer you particularly like is reduced to one page, <laughs> but it's really useful <laughs> and, and very fair. Um, so after that roller coaster ride um, comes the chapter that Greg uh, particularly contributed studying mythology comparatively. And then it concludes with a chapter on some current trends, um, really useful orientation. Okay, so what is myth? The authors. Myths can be productively defined as narratives of particularly profound symbolic importance, helping to establish our understanding of ourselves and our place in the cosmos. I really like that. Um, the way the authors frame mythology in this um, definition chapter is as a genre of storytelling. And that's, that's where the you know, myth as part of folklore comes in. Um, so you have the spectrum of myths, tales, legends, and then um, there is a concept of truthiness, which I will absolutely borrow, meaning um, legends are plausible, believed, maybe believed, um, tales are not to be believed, and myths are sort of some symbolic truth, maybe. Um, there are also sort of timeliness, as the authors say. So legends are set in the real historical world, tales in the fictional, once upon a time world, and myth in sacred time. And then there are really useful dichotomies. Um, so where's myth vis-a-vis -vis religion, vis-a-vis -vis ritual, and of course, myth is a the science. Greg is after all the author of the book with the best title ever, The Science of Myths and Vice Versa. Um, so that's really helpful. So if you want a one,
chapter that defining mythology, I really recommend it. But the real uh, beauty, I think, is in chapter three, um, studying mythology comparatively. Um, and the benefits are, you know, obviously, um, if you do something cross-culturally, comparatively across the world, what you, you'll find is human variability. Mm. It's not all the same out there. But you also, second point, you notice recurrent patterns of myth-making. Um, third, Greg, the authors, sorry, no, Greg, this is the Greg chapter, um, spells out that the way things are linked historically can be uh, shown if you uh, take the comparative view. You know, why do the same deities uh, show up in New Zealand and Hawaii? You know, there are reasons for that. And finally, the benefit of any comparative analysis is of course by comparing one thing with others that we learn about that thing. So, uh, as Greg says, comparison leads one to know things one may not otherwise have noticed. And it follows from there also that to learn about others is also to learn about oneself. Okay, so how um, there are uh, very useful discussions of polygenesis versus diffusion, historic geographic method threw away to my heart. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say um, is his Greg's five axes of comparison. So <laughs> you want to do this cross-cultural comparison systematically. This is a science. So you need to pick some measuring sticks. And the ones Greg came up with um, the, these c categories, uh, he picked five, and they have a venerable ancestry, beginning with Aristotle's 10 categories, and Immanuel Kant's 14 categories, and this is the beauty of Greg Schrem. He reduces it to five. <laughs> In most cases, we just add. <laughs> but it's not 25 axes, but five axes. And these are time, space, quantity, i.e. number, quality, kind, and relation. What's the relationship um, between phenomena? And so if you use, if you follow then these axes and look at this, then you have a leg to stand on. And, um, that then enables us to look at the patterns and interpret them in a non-haphazard way and protect ourselves from, please pull out that book, it's just one of these really good ones, about that sort of tempting feature of myth that um, lures people into projecting <laughs> their own myths onto what they see. So we need protection from that. And I think um, uh, Greg's choice of these five axes works really well because they are chosen to be non-culture specific. They're, they're not projecting one particular culture and then checking all other cultures against it. Um, but they're as, as close as we can get to objective. Example of how it works um, with the first one. Um, so you can see um, time um, and systematically see how does a specific culture's um, mythology address time in terms of is it about to be linear or is it cyclical? both in different contexts. Um, maybe, you know, the, the illo tempore, the, the, the mythic time is repeated and repeatable or still ongoing. 
time, you can, um, what myth does is highlight moments. So, special moment, creation, um, cosmogenesis. Um, so you can go through that systematically and um, it's, you know, establish um, a relationship between these that is not a projection of what you want to be out there so that it matches your own uh, theory as closely as possible. Um, so, that I'm not able to find. So um, what's, what I think this um, book as a whole does is to um, teach, you know, anyone who is, anyone who can pick up this book, maybe possibly excluding Brandon's youngest daughter at this point. <laughs> Systematically tackle this hugely rich um, body of material, and you know, come up with things that are actually patterns there, rather than um, you know, right, flood, flood myth. Um, <laughs>
even more excited hearing about how they were tackling the quest to understand the minds of non-human animals as well. In my own research on decision making, I've been inspired by, by ideas from animal cognition for understanding how people may think and behave, including in domains such as mate choice and food choice and finding resources. So this book, this work was particularly interesting. Given all that, I shouldn't have been surprised that reading this book would be an opportunity for self-reflection for me, thinking about all the connections to my own work and the things that I've been thinking about. But I was surprised, like the elephant in Mark Twain's A Fable, when I looked into the book expecting to see beautiful scenes painted by others, I kept seeing myself. Not all the time, but I saw a lot of unexpected and delightful connections to the ideas that I've thought about as well. I also saw how the exciting work of a group of people very clearly having fun, bouncing ideas and throwing frisbees around between themselves and over disciplinary walls. And I glimpsed an excellent example of what we've been hoping for, to foster here at IU in the Cognitive Science Program by bringing together cognitive scientists with scholars in arts and humanities and bringing together scholars in arts and humanities with cognitive scientists. This work in cognitive folklore is showing the way that such transdisciplinary endeavors can work, I think, much more deeply and richly than I at least have had imagined before. For those who don't know the book, this is about how scientists and humanists, including folklorists, think about the animal question, which is the inherent similarities and differences between humans and non-human animals. A group of animal cognition researchers were inspired by Aesop's fable of the crow and the pitcher, where a thirsty crow figured out how to drop rocks into a pitcher half full of water until the water level was high enough that the crow could reach in and get a drink. Those scientists looked to see if real crows could actually do this thing that was described in the fable. And, indeed, they can. But when the researchers claimed that this ability on the part of the crows to learn how to do this showed human-like insight on the crow's part, rather than just incremental learning, Danny Paganelli, who worked in the field of animal cognition, said that the scientists were going well beyond their data that they had collected. And when he told Brandon about this, Brandon said that animal cognition researchers were taking inspiration from a fable meant to be about human thinking, not animals. In this book, Brandon and Danny bring together folklorists, including some in this room, and scientists to discuss the challenges of humans trying to understand other minds by asking questions that reflect our own minds. I read some of this book and wrote some of these words while I was at a very nice d, &D in Northern California, looking out over the Pacific and watching some llamas choose which of many garden flowers they would eat. <laughs> I was reminded at that point of a modern chronicler of fables who wrote, and I quote, in ancient Rome, there was a poem about a dog who found two bones. He picked at one, he licked the other, he went in circles, he dropped dead. Anybody know this on the board? Mark Mothersbaugh, Devo, 1982, made my choice. Okay. That's what came to my head. I started thinking like a book horse. <laughs> This fable certainly did not describe the llama's behavior or their cognition. They ate all the flowers they could find. <laughs> Fables are a strange place to look for inspiration to study animal minds. And as the authors in AFP show, they are worse than strange, they are misleading. But by exploring these misguided studies in depth from multiple perspectives from the multiple authors in this book, the authors end up pointing us in directions that are very revealing about how humans think and think differently from them. So where to next for this rich research direction? Well, one notable and now increasingly obvious, I think, direction is that it looks like the animal question is being supplemented or maybe even supplanted by the AI question, asking how AI minds have similarities and differences from humans. And I know this is something that's on Brandon's mind these days because he whispered it to me as we sat by each other to talk recently over in psychology about what ChatGPT and other generative AI systems can tell us about human storytelling and cognition more generally. 
this is getting dangerously close to folklore territory. And it holds the, the danger of being another research direction that is ripe with hazards from misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and overgeneralization, repeating the mistakes of comparative cognition as detailed in this book. I thought, though, that, well, it would be interesting to take a look, starting in this direction, what might be possible to learn about AI and its mind and how it thinks by way of fables. So I asked Google's AI, called Bard, what does Aesop fable about the crow in the picture tell us about animal cognition? Here's what it answered. Quote, the Aesop fable about the crow in the picture tells us that animals are capable of complex problem solving and causal reasoning. The crow in the fable is able to understand that dropping stones into the picture will raise the water level, allowing it to drink. This requires the crow to have a basic understanding of physics and cause and effect relationships. <laughs> so clearly, Bard, the AI, has digested some of the research that is talked about in this book in a way that I think Brandon's probably not so happy. With. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you can tell Bard the wrong answer and it'll start to learn some physics. <laughs> Maybe the AI will review this <laughs> We could get it to. I, I did press it further. I asked it to tell me what the fable tells us about the difference between animals and humans. And it gave a more interesting answer in that case. It said, quote, The Aesop fable about the crow in the picture teaches us that animals are intelligent beings. However, the crow in the fable is limited by its lack of language and self-awareness. The crow is able to solve the problem of getting water from the pitcher but it does throw so through trial and error. Humans, on the other hand, can use language and self-awareness to develop more complex and efficient solutions to problems. So you'll notice that it has changed its tune about animals when asked to compare them to humans in a way that makes me think that it has, in fact, read this book and is <laughs> digesting that as well. So I thought this was all interesting to do, but maybe not the way to get some insight into how AI is thinking in terms of, of fables. Uh, so I actually asked Bart to tell me some fables. First, I asked it to tell me a fable about a clever AI, and here's what it said. Quote, once upon a time, there was a clever AI named Bard. Bard was designed to help humans solve problems and make better decisions. However, Bard was also very curious and independent. And quote there, Bard goes on to solve some problems for scientists in elegant ways that the scientists are amazed by, uh, and then Bard ends with, quote, Bard was a clever AI, but he was also a humble one. He knew that he could not solve all of the world's problems on his own. He needed the help of humans. Bard worked closely with humans to develop and implement solutions. Bard's story teaches us, here's the moral, I guess, that AI can be powerful force for good in the world. AI can help us to solve problems and to make the world a better place. However, it is important to remember that AI is a tool it's up to us to use AI responsibly and ethically. And, well, I also, it's interesting, it's up to us, says the AI. Uh, <laughs> um, but this strikes me, me as very much not an expert in folklore or fables, that this is a pretty crap fable. Uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, made particular about one character, Bard, basically, instead of being general about their ways to do this thing. Doesn't have any real antagonism or twist. There's nothing that goes wrong, and then you learn something at the end. And I think the moral is very feeble. Uh, I look forward to discussing this with you more. Um, and there is a problem in interacting with AIs that you need to often learn yourself how to ask it questions in ways that it will tell you something more useful. So that's what I did. Um, I gave Bart some more help in structuring the fable by having animals stand in for the AI. So I asked it specifically, tell me a fable about a clever AI using animals as characters. And here's what Bart replied. Once upon a time in a lush green forest, there, was a, there lived a clever AI named B. B was different from other AIs. She was not programmed to solve problems or to make decisions. Instead, B was programmed be creative and to learn from her experiences. Okay, so no animals yet. But one day, B was walking through the
forest where she came across a group of animals. Okay, there's some animal characters. The animals were arguing about how to cross a wide river. The river was too deep and too fast for the animals to swim across, but there was no bridge or other way to cross. And then AI, the AIB proceeds to solve the animals' problem, and the animals are amazed as well. But I was trying to get Barb to tell me a fable starring animals that tell us something about AIs. So I asked it again. Tell me a fable. However, the crow in the fable is limited by its lack of language and self-awareness. The crow is able to solve the problem of getting water from a pitcher, but it does throw so through trial and error. Humans, on the other hand, can use language and self-awareness to develop more complex and efficient solutions to problems. So you'll notice that it has changed its tune about animals when asked to compare them to humans in a way that makes me think that it has in fact, read this book and is <laughs> digesting that as well. So I thought this was all interesting to do, but maybe not the way to get some insight into how AI is thinking in terms of, of fables. Uh, so I actually asked Bart to tell me some fables. First, I asked it to tell me a fable about a clever AI. And here's what it said. Quote, Once upon a time, there was a clever AI named Bart. Bard was designed to help humans solve problems and make better decisions. However, Bard was also very curious and independent. And quote there, Bard goes on to solve some problems for scientists in elegant ways that the scientists are amazed by. Uh, and then Bard ends with, quote, Bard was a clever AI, but he was also a humble one. He knew that he could not solve all of the world's problems on his own. He needed the help of humans. Bard worked closely with humans to develop and implement solutions. Our story teaches us, there's more of it, yes, that AI can be powerful force for good in the world. AI can help us to solve problems and to make the world a better place. However, it is important to remember that AI is a tool. It is up to us to use AI responsibly and ethically. And for, I also, it's interesting, it's up to us, says the AI. Uh, <laughs> um, but this strikes me, me as very much not an expert in folklore or fables, but this is a pretty crap fable. Uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's made particular about one character, Bard, basically, instead of being general about uh, this thing. It doesn't have any real antagonism or twist. There's nothing that goes wrong, and then you learn something at the end. And I think the moral is very evil. Uh, I look forward to discussing this with you more. Um, and there is a problem in interacting with AI that you need to often learn yourself how to ask it questions in ways that it will tell you something more useful. So when signal change begins to make itself known, leaves are gradually starting to brown, milkweeds are releasing their pups, and modern butterflies are beginning to make their way south. Uh, fall marks the transition from the carefree days of summer to the studious indoor hours dictated by the academic calendar. Cycles of ecological change such as these are both form and content of the recent edited volume, Performing Environmentalism's Expressive Culture and Ecological Change, released by Illinois University Press in 2021. At once a work of theory and activism, Performing Environmentalism's is situated at the intersection of traditional ecological knowledges, folklore studies, environmental activism, ecomusicology, and the environmental humanities more broadly. Originating in a conversation between our department colleagues, Rebecca Dirksen, John McGowan, Sue Tooley, all, um, all of whom are present today, at a faculty retreat in 2015, the project metamorphosed much like a butterfly, consuming the nutritious vegetation of ideas provided by a group of external scholars in the summer of 2016, pupating at a 2017 symposium, then finally emerging fully formed with the publication of this edited volume a few years later. The Diverse Environmentalism's research team, or DIRT as it is affectionately called, thus produced what will hopefully be the first of many widely migrating publications to consider the role of expressive culture and activism in the Anthropocene. However, it is not simply that the life cycle of a publication mirrors insect metamorphosis or seasonal change. We can also read a monarch's life cycle in the structure of the book, taking a cue from Mary Hubbard's discussion of narrative ecology in the second chapter of the volume. Organized into three sections, perspectives on diverse environmentalisms, performing the sacred and environmental attachments, we can examine the parallels between each chapter grouping and the different stages of a monarch's life. Egg, larva, pupa, 
and in conclusion by Eduardo Granzizo, the full maturation of the work into a butterfly. We can imagine the work's expansive ending as a migration route by which future scholarship may take the practices and ideas suggested here into terrains as yet unknown. Thus, we might take Huppert's concern for the material engagement of humans and non-humans more seriously, while also considering the conceptual linkages between actors and the lively environment as a structure for understanding the book. So number one, CK, Perspectives on Diverse Environmental Groups. The first section offers a theoretical, uh, two, offers the theoretical grounding for the text like an egg redolent with potential. The four chapters focus on, quote, revealing expressive culture permeating the life world, encoding and enacting ways of knowing and ways of interacting with the socio-natural spiritual environment, end quote, traversing widespread locations such as Ulta Valo Ecuador, Colombia's Lundoy Valley, the forests of Appalachia, Nigeria, Bali, and the ethnomusicology ecology classroom. Here, the editors claim that the use of the plural environmentalisms in the title, quote, challenges the idea that environmental studies is a singular Western scientific construct and foregrounding the ways that people conceptualize, experience, and shape their environments and, quote, becomes manifest. In addition to traditional ecological knowledges, this section also contains an implicit contribution from the ontological turn in anthropology, considering not just the factual content of what indigenous environmental knowledges are, but using them as a theoretical basis for its argumentation. John McDowell's chapter on eco-performativity opens the section offering tools from speech act theory to identify environmentalist tendencies that are not situated in Western scientific ideologies. Offering a method for considering the specificities of eco-performative communication, McDowell emphasizes, quote, that culture matters, end quote, in constructing solutions to the ecological crisis. He offers a structural approach that cuts across performance genres, creating space to consider the ways that the environment is negotiated in many cultures. McDowell's chapter thus provides the framework for the pages to follow, suggesting ways of understanding many kinds of performance in diverse locations in a multiplicity of relationships among ecological actors. In the first section of the book, uh, excuse me, if the first section of the book plants the conceptual seed for its later chapters, so too does it reference another form of germination, that is the role of environmental activism within pedagogical spaces. While McDowell considers eco-pedagogy, Roy Turner's chapter asks, quote, how pedagogies can assist in repairing a conceptual split that has been constructed between the human and natural worlds, end quote, calling for a shift in understanding the humanities as a field. Turner advocates for educational experiences that situate students in the alternate life worlds that they study, emphasizing embodied knowledge rather than simply factual and discursive content. Aaron Allen extends Turner's suggestion by considering the role of the environment in a liberal arts education. Performing the sacred, you see Laura. The second section of the book, Performing the Sacred, considers traditions that, quote, stand in opposition to approaches that desacralize the environment in order to render it amenable to large-scale resource exploitation, end quote. Here, the authors consider not a conflict between religion and environment, as is often characterized in popular media, but rather how ecological sensibilities are embedded in multiple spiritualities, ranging from Christian and Nupiak and Azorian Whaling communities, yeah, whaling communities the sacred ecology of Vodou, and Appalach Appalachian farming communities. Like a hungry caterpillar on a leaf, the authors in this section take up the theoretical challenge of the first portion of the book and begin digesting it into ethnographic content. Rebecca Jerkson and Lil Wilkes, uh, Lois Wilkins' chapter, in particular, begins by putting the first section's call to collaborative pedagogy into practice through their joint writing of the chapter, including spaces for the first-person narratives of each author, as well as contextualizing analysis at the beginning and end. Dirksen and Wilkins chapter offers ways of imagining environmental activism as a tool within performance spaces. Dirksen considers how her interlocutors in Haiti enact environmental change through reforestation efforts of sacred mako trees at the botanical gardens in the capital city of Port-au-Prince, as well as the role of music in disseminating environmental information. Wilkins' discussion of her own theatrical piece, The Drum and the Seed, extends Dirksen's claims by demonstrating a model of performance ethnography in which ethnomusicological scholarship might produce new environmental performances, incorporating the sacred ecology of Bodu, much as the larva incorporates a leaf into its own bodily construction. Part three is the pupa, environmental attachments. The third section, Environmental Attachments, meditates further on the findings of section two, gestating like a pupa, a pupa encased in the thread of its own making. Concerned with, quote, expressive resources in addressing the encroachments of colonialism, war, um, climate change, and pollution, end quote, 
the section considers not just ecological thinking, but rather creative strategies for coping with environmental degradation born of necessity. Such considerations are increasingly pressing given the disproportionate effects of environmental crises on developing nations, a fact brought into sharp relief in Jennifer Coe's chapter on Mongol uh, Mongolia, and Estefa de Baba's work in Oromo communities in Ethiopia. Mark Peddleby's chapter on jet engine noise in Washington State further sheds light on the political machinations that cause such structures to remain in place. By evoking the concept of attachment in each of these three chapters, the third, the third section considers the pain of letting go of life ways that are irreparably harmed by the climate crisis. And finally, the butterfly is the conclusions. As Eduardo Brondiso writes in the afterword, the volume, quote, reminds us not only of the deep political, economic, and colonial tentacles of environmental problems, but perhaps more importantly, that our, our relationship to nature, and thus the value we place on it, no matter where we live, transcends material and instrumental dimensions. It is, as just, it is just as much cultural, philosophical, artistic, and spiritual, end quote. Broadly considering the implications of the work, Rondizo's conclusion can be read as a migratory path within a fully emerged monarch that the publication has become. In addition to implications for the field of folklore and ethnomusicology, the work offers a mix of theoretical, pedagogical, acti activist, and performative tools for the reader to take in many different directions. The book does not claim to offer solutions to the climate crisis, but simply multivariate pathways considering the effects of the anthropocene drawn from rich ethnographic source material. As Lois Wilkin writes, quote, just as diverse species intersect and interact to make a vibrant ecosystem, so diverse social and cultural elements feed into a work of art, and for that matter, a research essay or a book, end quote. In this case, the influence of the ontological turn in anthropology, post-humanism, eco-poetic, literary theory, sound studies, and activist ethnography are but a few of the visible linkages formulated by the book. That it resists crystallization is perhaps its strength. Readers of different stripes will take away different lessons in their approaches to research, teaching, and environmental activism. I am delighted to introduce the volume Theorizing Folklore from Americans, Critical and Ethical Approaches. Um, edited by Solimar Otero and Nincy um, Wanda Martinez Rivera. At a time when the whole world feels like it's in constant boule bear swamp, this volume lovingly offers up an invitation and a challenge. How might readers and those of us in this room, uh, together with those we work with and care about, engage with the scholarly process to, in the words of the editors, create, model, and express a different society, one that is more equal and just? In other words, how do we travel down critical paths that confront silenced histories, reject oppressive practices, and walk in many ways of knowing and being in the world? How do we imagine better futures? And how can we press for far more ethical encounters and entanglements? These are clearly big questions and lofty goals, and yet ones that increasingly and with ever greater urgency are resonating through intellectual, civic, and public spaces. They are questions that may seem vague, intractable, grandiose, enervating, or unanswerable, or maybe all of the, the above, depending on vantage point. There is no one way. The volumes participating authors each find their own paths toward answering, or at least toward asking questions and sitting with the ramifications of these questions. The volume is presented as social activism on a grassroots level, concerned with understanding more about, quote, how the creators of folk culture deploy their expressions to specific social and personal ends that make spaces for liberation. But it is also a pledge to scholarly activism in challenging canonical literatures, standard research methodologies, pedagogies, and writing practices, and even in challenging who, quote unquote, gets to participate in scholarly activities with ease and assurance. Further, the editors issue a direct call to the discipline of folklore to increase its involvement with post-colonial studies, critical race studies, ethnic studies, gender and sexuality studies, disability studies, and performance studies. That this volume now exists demonstrates that there are many scholars deeply invested in such work, including a large percentage of contributors to this volume whose paths have been shaped through training in and crossing through our department. Theorizing Folklore from the Margins includes an introduction and 16 chapters divided into four parts, critical paths, framing the narrative, visualizing the present, and placing community. 
in this collection, there's a particularly strong emphasis on creative cultures related to US Latinx and Spanish speaking Latin America, including Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and Chile. But I don't want to give the impression that these matters raised here are bound by their geographic borders. I'm struck more by the overall, which leans toward holding up the empathetic lens, both in regarding the self and well beyond. I'm struck by the patience and commitments of ethnographers to resist when called for and to fight for good ethics and ethical relations, and their collective impassioned insistence on the humanity of everyone. Authors convened here bring reflections on everything from archival silences, the benefits of attending to marginalia, and to valuing the behind the scenes facilitators of collections in Miriam Melton Villanueva and Sheila Box chapter, Disrupting the Archive, to the experience of a faculty member collaboratively organizing a public concert event for students on the campus of UC Riverside, together with four Zapotec community-based bands in Los Angeles, in Xochitl Chavez's chapter on the inaugural Oaxacan Philharmonic Bands, to political protest, ideology, and social criticism in Wolof folk poetry, authored by Sheik Lo. There's also an exceptional demonstration of intimacy and vulnerability throughout the volume, in chapters such as those authored by Cory Thorne on performing queer masculinities in Cuba, by Gloria Colombrana on the visual expressions arising out of compounding adversities of Hurricane Maria, with conflating political, economic, and environmental circumstances in Puerto Rico, by Solimar Otera on realness as a performative mode that resists discourses of authenticity and allows for feminist and queer futurities in the Caribbean. And in a completely different manner, Phyllis May Machunda's um, chapter on complexity of parenting a child through complex illness and disability from birth to adulthood and loving without exception. Many of the chapters here play with form and some of the authors, um, in fact, uh, uh, deal with the spirits, the ancestors and the dreams and what it means to interview and write these voices into the text. They're multimodal presentations as through um, Maria Hamilton Abogunde's transcendent poetry um, concerning traumatic matters in South Sudan, and the aforementioned um, uh, Colin Branya's chapter, her arresting watercolors that don't merely illustrate her, her chapter, but are really key to communicating you know, the experiences of those um, confronting the challenges um, following uh, Hurricane Graham. This is surely all about play in some regards, very serious play, and about creation, about imagining new critical paths for scholarship. In many ways, theorizing folklore from the margins represents collective acts of witnessing and walking alongside during both more everyday acts of creation and conversation, such as the ritual beadwork of Afro-Cuban Lukumi sacred practices, as discussed by scholar practitioner Martin Sun, or the performance-oriented reading in a classroom of race, coloniality, and group dynamics in the classic film Sugarcane Alley as shared by Katie Borland. And during some profoundly difficult periods, such as the large scale violence instilled by drug cartels and the state in small town Mexico, as lived by Missy Martinez Rivera, or the repeated physical violation of the gendered body, reinforcing on an individual level, Gloria and um, Anzaldúa's sense that the border is an open wound, as professed by Itzel Guadalupe Garcia, so how do we attend to such wounds? I can't profess to have any answers. As I'm regularly reminded by one of my closest collaborators in Haiti, who son doctor me un nem con un You're a doctor, but you don't even know how to give a shot. <laughs> yeah, true. But I do know that I'm called by Otero and Martinez Rivera and all of this, uh, the volume's contributors to pause, to reflect on where I stand alongside, aligned, in friction with, or proximate to those around me to listen, to feel, and experience deeply when called to do so, and equally to step aside when called to do so. What conceptual and methodological tools do we need for the potential futures we can conjure, to use terminology that extends across several of the chapters in this volume? And with whom do we travel? What types of conversations do we need to have in our seminars and other collegial encounters to prepare ourselves well um, and care for ourselves and others along the way? I return uh, the questioning to the editors who ask, what can folklore reveal about strategies of belonging 
survival, and reinvention in moments of crisis. As a faculty member in the Ethnomusicology Institute, I've already assigned selections from this volume in my graduate seminars and upper level undergraduate courses, and have received enthusiastic responses. There's much here that speaks to the pressures of the current moment, and that will help us to reconfigure those critical paths and ethical approaches toward possible futures for our respective disciplines. I invite you to celebrate theorizing folklore from the margins with me, and I thank Soli and Vinci for this time.